Perfect. Sandy, it's good to see you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for having me. I think potentially I've realized that what I'm about to present might be a little bit provocative. Um, uh, so to please receive it in the spirit in which it's been intended. Um, I, I'm going to talk very quickly today about um, where your data comes from. Um, who, who are the people that are, that are making it? Who are the people that are at the end of the phone line uh, doing all this uh, work? So often, uh, online data collection uh, comes from uh, places like uh, crowdsourcing platforms. Um, you, you could, you know, we could talk about things like prolific when they're crowdsourcing platforms. I mean, MTurk is obviously the prototypical uh, kind of crowdsourcing uh, platform. Um, there's a few things I want to think about very quickly in this short talk, which is why is it cheap? Why is it quick? What's the experience of workers like? Um, and how do people work in these contexts? So that's quite ambitious for, for a 10 or 15 minute talk. Um, but we'll get through the um, uh, at pace. Um, I'd say coming coming after the, the, the talks I've seen already today, um, that in in our in our research we focused on Mechanical Turk, um, and there are other, I would say describe them as more responsible platforms available. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, so quick and cheap. Uh, Ali Al Khatib uh, has been doing. Uh, has has thought of doing participation in, in the kind of studies we've been talking about as as piecework. Um, piecework is the idea you get don't get paid for the time that you work, you get paid for some kind of uh, output that you produce. Um, and this has unfortunate uh, connections with Victorian workhouses, which was the kind of uh, historically a huge place for piecework, where you get paid for the number of uh, gloves that you made or nets that you sewed or, or whatever. Um, so there's this unfortunate historical comparison in terms of, of, of piecework and getting paid to do a thing uh, rather than getting paid for the time it takes you uh, to do it. So what's the experience like? Uh, many participants, at least on Amazon Mechanical Turk, are basically professionals. Uh, they're, not, they're not kind of people dropping in to do uh, a study. We saw earlier in the talk, um, you know, it seems that most prolific uh, 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 contributors um, contribute a couple of things a week, not very much. Uh, if you're recruiting on Mechanical Turk, many of your participants will be professionals. They derive the majority of their income uh, from work that they do on AMT. Uh, why, why are these platforms cheap? Well, um, uh, a study from a couple of years ago showed that only 4% of, of workers on AMT earn more than $7.25, that's about £5.80 an hour, that's only 4%. So uh, that's the top end, top 4% uh, of all earners um, on AMT uh, in more than uh, $7.25 an hour. So one of the reasons why it's often cheap is because we don't pay um, the people who are participating in these studies um, as we should. Um, uh, wage theft is, is not unusual. Uh, so workers uh, ha have tried to do something about this. So people uh, take part in studies um, and then their work is rejected for, for really no good reason. Um, uh, workers have attempted, uh, Lily Arani's done a lot of work to try and do something about this with the Turk Opticon platform. Uh, Mary Gray has, has, has written a lot about ghost work or the sort of disappearance of labour into these uh, kind of uh, platforms and systems. Um, and I think it's important to say that um, uh, Akita Sal wrote a very uh, highly cited paper about contributing on these kind of platforms that we, we often use for behavioural uh, science um, in 2013. Um, there were a lot of problems listed in that, and unfortunately, it's not clear uh, that we have made a huge amount of, of progress uh, in the meantime. So, how you know what 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 kind of what kind of happening when people are, are doing these um, doing these kind of tasks? Uh, what's what goes on in, in these in these rooms on, on, on public transport um, at work? So, some people moonlight; they they complete some of these tasks while someone else is paying them to do another job. Um, and it's really important that people are part of this, this bigger socio-technical system. Uh, there's all these sort of social, physical and technological contexts that go into what happens when people are, are participating. Um, there are many people on, on, on Mechanical Turk who are working on it uh, full time. So an average session to sit down and work through, sit down, I'm sitting down, I'm going to do some work now. Uh, even five years ago, that was four hours. So participants, they're not just picking up these tasks as a, as a kind of a one-off thing 
uh, to do in an idle moment, a lot of them are working effect effectively full time in, in, in quite, uh, uh, quite long periods of, of time on them. Uh, and they're real human beings. So they live in a house. Um, you know, uh, my son is, is in the room behind me. I've got two dogs. Uh, all I need is the postman to, to, to come. And before you know it, uh, my context becomes very dynamic and very loud. So some people who are participating, we know from our own data, that sometimes people are, are parenting and they're working. Uh, sometimes they have undivided focus. Uh, sometimes people are fresh working on your tasks. It might be the first thing they pick up of the day. Um, or they might be tired. They might be fatigued. It might be that they've done eight hours of, of, of behavioral experiments already today. Um, and, and they are quite uh, fatigued. One of the things that we focused on specifically, and this work um, has been done in collaboration um, with Anna and Duncan, um, and also uh, our student Laura Lasko has been, uh, uh, been doing a lot of work on this over the last few years, uh, is to understand how people are uh, multitasking in this, in this complex context. So we know that people switch often in online context to other tasks. Um, uh, and this multitasking can be an, uh, uh, not a good thing for your study, um, or it can be a good thing. We've used it in our own work uh, to study multitasking. That's what my, my PhD used about multitasking many moons ago. Um, uh, and actually, the way that people are working, they're, because they're doing real work in these contexts, it's basically their job. Actually, these platforms can provide a kind of ecological validity uh, to some uh, studying certain phenomena that you couldn't otherwise get. But I think it's really important to point out that a lot of times people aren't multitasking because they're they're chilling or, um, or, or busy playing video games at the same time they're participating. It's actually, there's a huge amount of uh, meta work involved in participating, which is hidden from you um, as, a, as a researcher. Um, but there's a, there's a vast amount of time that goes into uh, finding tasks to do, working out what needs to be done next uh, and prioritizing. Um, and all this meta work is, is not compensated. Um, uh, and it's, it's kind of not something that the, that platform requires you to think about but it is a huge amount of work. So often one of the reasons that people are switching to different tasks uh, is for this exact reason. They are, uh, they're trying to work out what it is they're gonna do next, what they completed, has their work been approved? All this meta work, um, because these, the, the, these people act as contractors, uh, is not compensated. I think the big thing uh, that we, we talk about in a paper we published last year is that there are constraints. There are constraints from platforms, so, um, what's the balance of risk in a platform? Who takes on the risk? Well, Amazon take on no risk, right? They run this platform, uh, they take a cut of everything that happens, and if it all goes wrong, it doesn't really make any difference to them. Uh, who gets to make decisions about work quality? Is that people who are doing the, doing the work, or is it people who are requesting it, or is it the platform? Uh, whose needs is a platform designed to serve? Is it designed to serve the needs of workers, or is it designed to serve the needs of, of people requesting data? Uh, we put, as requesters, um, I've used these platforms, uh, we put constraints on people. How long do you give participants to complete a task? Do you need the data immediately, right? So one of the things uh, that we've heard about is how quickly you can recruit data using these kind of platforms and, you know, the wonders of, of being able to walk away, get a cup of tea and 300 people have done your study. Why do we need to do that? Um, in my own experience, I've had participants tell me they set alarms to wake them up in the middle of the night uh, if there is a task that pays sufficiently an hour that becomes available. Right? Do we need our data that badly? Do we need it in 24 hours? Is it going to sit on your hard drive for six months until you finish teaching so you can do the analysis for it? Um, I think we really need to reflect on this as researchers. Why, why, why is FAST a good thing in this context? Why do we need all this data so quickly? Does your task actually work? Broken tasks are super, super common. Um, and then people don't get paid for, for trying to do broken tasks and debugging other people's tasks for them. Do your instructions make sense? Are they, are, they, are, they, are they comprehensible to, to someone who's not a researcher? Are they comprehensible to someone trying to do it online? And then people have their own con, uh, constraints as well. So some people are polychronic, they like to multitask, and some people don't. They like to focus on one thing at a time. People have intrinsic preferences for certain tasks. You'll, you'll hear talking to these participants, or some of them love to do um, you know, timing-based tasks, or they prefer questionnaires, or uh, whatever. Uh, equipment varies hugely. We know this from our own work, so you can't rely. I think this has come up time and time again today. Uh, you can't rely on participants having any kind of predictable technology. Um, and the capacity work, uh, uh, for work varies within a single participant. Right? I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there are good participants and bad participants. Uh, there are people out to gain the system, as in all systems, but they make up a small proportion of, of any pool. What happens is that people's capacity to do good or bad work varies over time, like our own does. Right? Some days we have good days and some days we have bad days. I think we also have responsibility to think about that as well. So, sorry, sorry, Joe. Um, 
Uh, so when we collect data online, we have to think about, uh, avoid thinking about magic boxes, and we need to remember there are people at the end of the wire. So that's partly for data quality reasons, also for social and ethical reasons. Are you in a rush? Give people time. We've all had bad days. Do you really need to reject that data as long as it's hard to produce? Uh, respect the time that you're not paying for, uh, but it's necessary for people to be able to participate. And please design human-centered tasks. There are actual human beings uh, participating in these studies, and please try and remember that. Thank you very much. Nice and Sandy, thank you very much. In fact, I, I really like I really like that point because when you're interacting with um, people face to face in a lab or in a imaging center or whatever, you can't help but realize this is a real person right in front of you, and that is super easy to lose when you're doing these things online. And it's important that we don't. I mean, these are people who are taking their time and contributing to your science, right? And um, and obviously. I'd say that the vast majority of people do value that and do want to take that seriously, but it's it's harder to do that if you're not personally interacting with them. So I love hearing, you know, there's a voice of skepticism and warning there that is very, very appropriate. And I think it's important that it's heard and that we all take those messages seriously. What I'd like to do is just sort of open it up to uh, to our panel um, because we had um, we've had three amazing speakers and we've raised a lot of really fun issues. Some of you have raised different sides of the same coin. So of course, if you want to bring up issues with other speakers talks, please feel free. Um, but before we before we jump into this panel session, I just want to tell people what's happening in 15 minutes at four o'clock. We're going to split into three different rooms. One room, health research will stay here. It will be live streaming. There are two other rooms, one about testing kids online and one about auditory research online. If you go to the main Be Online um, event page, the links are there and you can join those rooms five minutes before four o'clock. But otherwise, over to the panel session. I just thought I'd sort of prime the pump by um, talking a little bit about representative samples. This is a topic that's come up um, in, in everybody's talk at some level. And um, I, I'm wondering, I, mean, I think for a long time, psychology in particular hasn't taken this seriously at all. Uh, and we have our weird participants and that was fine. But um, now it seems to be a big, bigger issue and a lot of people might be not taking it seriously again. Like, well, of course I used MTurk, I used Prolific, I used Sona, um, that's all. Uh, so therefore they were more, what is your experience? How representative are the people that we're talking to? And, you know, what, speaking to Sandy's point, if you have a bad day and you maybe, for whatever reason, your data were shit one day, are you now pro prohibited from being on the system? You know, what, how do those issues all play out? Excuse my use of, uh, language. Does anyone want to jump in? You can all turn turn your mics on since it's just us, if you'd like. I could get started. Um, gotcha. Thank you. So um, I think I'd answer that question from two angles. So it, it sounds like you're touching upon data quality on the one hand and then representativeness on the other. So regarding the point about, you know, having a bad day and then being kicked out of the system, that's not how we approach this from our end. So we take a, really a conjunction of all sorts of inputs into our models before we definitively exclude someone, right? So Andrew was talking about different, you know, sources of information that say, you know, how do they answer, how did the participants answer the pre-screening questions? Or, you know, are they using VPNs? So it's like a bunch of technical checks, behavioral checks, and, it is a tricky question, right? At what point do you say someone's kicked out? And I won't be able to disclose it right now, right? How exactly we make that decision, because what we don't want is, you know, participants then having that information potentially and trying to circumvent kind of yeah. rules we use. But it is a, 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 um, a collection of input, right? Not just one piece of behavior. And regarding representativeness, um, I don't think there's such a thing as a perfectly representative sample. It always depends on how do you define representativeness? How do you stratify your sample? Is it just age, ethnicity, and sex? Is it other dimensions? Maybe, you know, socioeconomic status or education level. And the way I see it is that we're trying to move towards more diversity and inclusion. You know, if you only recruit from you know Oxford students 
that's certainly really unrepresentative and really biased. And what you're trying to do is then move away from the bias as much as you can, but there's always constraints, right? There's no such thing as perfectly representative. I think, just to add to that as well, I think, yeah, I think uh, Kat's point that there's no perfect representative sample is a really good one. And it's always worth bearing in mind that um, as we move away from these kind of undergrad samples and get to this, uh, you know, online tools where we can recruit from the broader population, that is definitely more representative. But um, you still got to ask yourself the question of who are the people who are actually coming online to do these experiments, right? And are they representative of the general population as well? Justin or Sandy, would you either of you care to add anything? Yeah, I think that the potential for online studies um, to get away from those weird participants is, is fantastic. I think the potential for these platforms is incredible. Um, I think the challenge is, uh, is to distinguish for, for a given, I mean, I, I am a trained psychologist, but the, the challenge is to distinguish when you do need um, these kind of specific samples, or if you just do need a broad population sample. I know there have been publications that suggest that things like the AMT sample, um, a random sample from AMT is, is more is significantly more diverse than the average when you'd get at a, a prestigious university, for example. Um, so I think there's loads and loads of benefits. I think absolutely online studies can do this. There's all sorts of people. I, I used to sit in, in Mallet Place in a, in a windowless lab, getting people to come into the lab and, and do experiments on a computer. Um, uh, that's already limiting it to people who've got the, the means, the time and the, the physical ability to get all the way into UCL from wherever they live, right? So I think the, 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 the power of doing online studies in terms of democratizing access to, 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 to participation this way are, are really great. Justin, you raised a, a really important point um, in, in your talk about accessibility um, with some of these things. And, and of course, that is something that in the current environment is maybe a little bit more prevalent in people's minds than it has been, um, particularly with, you know, captioning for videos and, and things like that. In fact, I, I don't know if how many people got a chance to look at posters, but one of the posters had closed captioning uh, embedded in it, which I was I was very impressed to see. Um, is that something that you worry about that, you know, our samples are perhaps systematically biased against certain segments of the population? Oh, uh, well, so a lot of our uh, the, the our customers are are universities, and so uh, universities typically have a requirement that all their technology be accessible to everyone. So we we undergo go reviews for that, and, and it's it's it can be a fair amount of work. There's a lot of little things that you never realize that if you're navigating this through a voice system because you are uh, visually impaired. There's a lot of stuff that can be a little difficult to get through, and then often the fixes are pretty small and minor, but but they're important uh, to ensure that. So from from our side, we're we ensure we comply because we need to because universities need to provide that to their uh, to everyone in on the campus. Um, but it is certainly something that can be overlooked, and I, I think it shouldn't be. Katya, you look like you wanted to say something. Oh, I disagree that that's so important, right? Accessibility and making it usable, well, for as many people as possible, right? And we're definitely working on this actively. For us as an early stage tech company with only 30 people, it is always challenging, right? To like, uh, to, to make it all uh, possible, but we are prioritizing it in general. So as a company, we care about that a lot. Right. Can I ask um, a sort of uh, a what if question for everybody, which is if you could have one thing that maybe it's five years down the road, 10 years or 30 years down the road that would make online testing or these subject recruitment aspects um, just infinitely better for you. What would you what would you love, whether it's technically available at the moment or not? Where, where would where are we going? I'll, I can, I, I can. So one area in, in I, I think we're getting there is uh, people talked about fraud and that can be an issue. Uh, how do you identify? And it's tough because you can't look at something, uh, look at your computer IP address. Well, what if you have two different people who just live in the same house or they're sharing an internet connection? Well, you can't exclude by that. There's a, you can't exclude by name. There's two people with the same name. There, there's a lot of different ways. So how can you uniquely identify a person? One is, well, you, you try, let's uh, 
go based on phone number, but it's one, it's now easy with Google Voice to create additional phone numbers and even that one can get tough. So if we were able to uniquely identify people, e even in a way where we're not tracking their uh, who they are, but just some kind of uh, hash or some way of uniquely identifying them, uh, I think that would make things uh, easier from many perspectives. There are um, countries that have uh, national ID cards and uh, they have a, oh, actually I have one here. So <laughs> here's the national ID card for Estonia because I, I used to live there. It's got a chip on the back so I can put it into a smart card reader, type a pin code and I'm proving it's me. So unless someone steals my card and knows my pin code, it's definitely me. And other countries are implementing this too, but that's a great way to uniquely identify a person, but you need to have a kind of common standard. Otherwise you're gonna run into technology problems and most people don't have that. One of the questions we get at Gorilla quite often is, um, can we do um, research on health populations? So are there recruitment population, recruitment services that specialize on, I, like I would know um, this person has depression or autism or, uh, dementia of some sort and you could not know who they are but you could have a validated this person has this clinical diagnosis and that I think would be uh, a game changing for health research but there isn't a company doing it at the moment um, I think there are lots of ethical uh, and data protection hurdles to make that possible but no doubt a solution will become available maybe it, it first needs what Justin's talking about that somebody can prove they are who they say they are and then you need a way of linking up to medical records security but without compromising um, health data uh, so that you're doing it responsibly as well. But I think that could be really exciting for researchers. Just to tie into that, I sort of dream of a world where you could basically have any kind of sample at your fingertips and the, the people in the sample are engaged and motivated truly to contribute to that study or piece of research. And, you know, in 10 years or 15 years, how incredible would it be if, if there was a platform that makes that possible, right? Where you can go to India through the internet, of course, right? So I'm thinking about it from an online point of view. You, you leverage the internet to recruit any kind of sample. And then one important question that I see that needs to be figured out, and I haven't seen anyone figure it out just yet, is the incentives piece, right? I'm acutely aware that monetary incentives will only reach a certain subset of the population in any given country, right? So can we be more creative? Can we come up with ways of incentivizing people to take part in a maybe, you know, charity donations, or maybe you get matched with projects that you really deeply care about. Maybe you're passionate about the topic of climate change or, you know, prejudice and discrimination and how to combat racism. Right. Can we match you up somehow? And how can we be creative about, you know, motivating people to take part in research, basically, like more broadly defined, not just, you know, small cash incentives. If we can figure that out in the next 10, 15 years and that way, you know, enable all sorts of people from around the world, not just North America and Europe to take part. That would be completely game changing, I think, uh, from my point of view. Cool. Yeah. Sandy, I'm wondering whether you're, you think that what we need really is a Charles Dickens of, um, of MTurk, you know, to take on the Victorian workhouse ethic of peace work or something along those lines. Am I over-interpreting? Well, I, th I, think, I think Nicky Kutur and his colleagues put it, put it best in that paper. And when he asked about this kind of work, is it something we'd want our kids to do? Um, and that's the nail on the head for me. Um, in 30 years, if, 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 if adding this to the kind of way people make a living is, uh, feels uh, less precarious and um, and all the problems I talked about, um, then that would be a great thing. So I think the technology can help us do it. It's just it's all the other stuff. Sure, we got to handle the people right, and that's that's actually a really good point to end on. I think at this point. So I'd just love to thank our, our panelists, our speakers from this session. It was really thought provoking and fantastic. Um, so.